Well, one of the most uh, theologically fascinating and plain entertaining books I've read in a long time is um, My Journal of the Council, written by uh, Yves Congar, Father Yves Congar. Um, now, Catholics of a certain age might know that name, but I'm afraid that most Catholics probably under 50 wouldn't even uh, recognize the name. But Yves Congar was a Dominican priest who was one of the most influential, maybe the most influential, um, theological expert at uh, Vatican II. And what's really fascinating is uh, Congar, throughout his career, had been by turns vilified, lionized, uh, loved, hated, exiled, etc. But found himself at the age of about 58 a paritas or theological expert at Vatican II. And there he uh, influenced enormously the writing of the texts on uh, Revelation, on the church, church in the modern world, etc., etc. So he was a major, major player. And the book I'm talking about is literally his journal of his time at the council. So it's a big book. He um, comments on all the events and personalities, often in a very arch way. I must say, of course, I studied over in France, and, and I knew the French um, academic scene a little bit, so I, I recognize the type. There's a certain um, old kind of withering you know, superiority that comes out sometimes, and Congar will uh, refer to some of the major players of the council and just say, you know, what a bore, or this one's useless, or this one talks too much. And so I would laugh out loud at some of these uh, arch remarks that he would make. But you know what comes through as you read this book, and, and not every page is compelling reading, but as you kind of work your way through it, and I'll use this overworked phrase, but the spirit of the council, by which I mean the great themes of Vatican II that indeed are found in the text. I mean the church's outreach to the modern world. I mean the focus on the renewal of the liturgy. I mean the universal call to holiness. I mean the recovery of God's word, the evangelical spirit. Uh, all these things that we associate legitimately with Vatican II. Well, see, Congar was one of the major uh, instigators of all this. He's going to meetings, he's giving speeches, he's running all across Rome, he's appearing at St. Peter's, he's talking, cajoling, wheedling, etc., trying to bring about these great motifs. And by all accounts, he was pretty remarkably uh, successful. As he was doing his work, and this comes through in the uh, pages of the journal, his great you know, enemies would be people like um, Archbishop Pericle Felice and Cardinal Ottaviani, who was the head of the, uh, of the Holy Office. They would have represented a somewhat you know, old-fashioned, very scholastic, defensive form of Catholicism that people like Congar uh, you know, were fighting. Who are Congar's allies? And they, too, are all over the pages of the journal. Well, the more you know, progressive figures, like Cardinal Frings of, um, of Cologne, uh, but also Archbishop, the young Archbishop Karol Wojtyla of uh, Krakow is a player in his journal. And then all of his theological um, colleagues, people like Karl Rahner, Edward Skilebex, Hans Kung, uh, Henri de Lubach, and a young German theologian called Josef Ratzinger. So all these players, were on Congar's side, and they were indeed bringing into expression this great spirit of Vatican II. What I found as I read the book was uh, I was caught up in the sort of euphoria of that time and seeing these figures, you know, coming back to life and seeing that time uh, coming back to life was, was very, you know, kind of exciting and exhilarating. At the same time, what struck me was there was a great split that occurred in the victorious party. So all the people I mentioned on the more progressive side that carried the day at Vatican II, in the years after Vatican II, a lot of those figures split with one another. For example, um, Karl Wojtyla becomes Pope John Paul II. He appoints Josef Ratzinger as his uh, head of the doctrine of faith. He makes Congar himself a cardinal, turns de Lubach into a cardinal, Urs von Balthasar and others. There's one side of it. On the other side, though, people like Skilebex and Kung and uh, Rahner um, stake out very different positions. And in fact, Karl Wojtyla, as Pope John Paul II, uh, pursues in an aggressive way, you know, Skilebex and Kung and many others. So there's the question, which I think is fascinating. What caused the rift between the two wings, if you want, of the Vatican II party. And here's one way to get at it. There are many ways we could approach it, but one way to get at it is to look at the emergence of the theological journal 
Comunio. Now here's the story. After the council, this international theological journal was born called Concilium Council, and it was meant to carry forth, you know, the spirit of Vatican II. Every figure I mentioned on the, on the Victoria side, you know, from Ratzinger to Rahner to Kung to all of them, were on the board of Concilium. And they saw this journal as carrying on the spirit of Vatican II. Well, not many years after it was founded, three major players on that board resigned. They were um, Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, Josef Ratzinger, and Henri de Lubac. They resigned and they formed this new journal called Communio. And even to this day, you might say Concilium and Communio represent the two, you know, warring perspectives of how to read Vatican II. What I find really illuminating is Ratzinger's reflection some years later on why the uh, three of them split and why they saw the need for communio over and against concilium. And here were the three things he said. And it, it helps to clarify why the two sides uh, split. He said, first of all, many of the um, board members of concilium wanted to form an alternate or alternative magisterium, teaching authority. So there's a teaching authority of the Pope and bishops, and then Ratzinger and company argued they seem to want to establish themselves, the theologians, as a sort of rival or alternative teaching authority. Well, I mean, certainly Balthazar and Ratzinger and, and company understood the importance of theology, but they also knew that church couldn't survive if it had two sort of rival teaching authorities. So they balked at that. Secondly, they said many of the members of the Concilium Board wanted Vatican III when the ink on the text of Vatican II was barely dry. In other words, they wanted to ride the progressive wave of Vatican II to all sorts of reforms that weren't called for by Vatican II. So let's say change in celibacy, women's ordination, change in the sexual teaching of the church, etc., etc. And we know that well. That's the whole agenda of much of, of liberal Catholicism, even to this day. And Ratzinger said, look, we just had Vatican II. We've barely begun to appropriate Vatican II, and you people want Vatican III. So that's the second reason they, they bought. Here's the third one that I think is the most interesting, really. He said, the very name of the journal, Concilium, Council, and the stated purpose to perpetuate the spirit of the Council, he said, that's not a good idea. Now, mind you, Ratzinger, um, de Lubach and those fellows were men of the council. They were at the council. They loved the council. But, Ratzinger said, councils are held rarely in the life of the church for good reason. Because during a council, the church has to, as it were, throw itself into question. It has to ask some fundamental questions about who it is and what it believes. And that's dangerous. That's problematic. It means the church's life is in suspense for that time. Which is why the church has councils, but also turns with relief from the council to get back to its life, to its work, which is why they called their magazine Communio, because they saw Communio as the essential life of the church. Now, I can testify to some of this because I came of age at that time when the common attitude was, well, the church's beliefs are all up for grabs. It's, they're in suspense. What do we believe about the Trinity, about Jesus, about the church, about morality? Well, who knows? The theologians are debating all of that. Well, see, the church can't survive that way. It's like if suddenly all the rules of baseball were up for grabs. If suddenly all the rules of golf were up for grabs. Well, people couldn't play baseball. They couldn't play golf, you know? And so Ratzinger said, we don't want to perpetuate the spirit of the council. We love the council. We were, we were the great figures of the council, but we don't want to perpetuate its spirit. We want the church to get back to its essential uh, work. That's why I think, um, reading this text of, of uh, Congar, where all these men of the council are on display, uh, is very instructive, very illuminating. And also to um, consider the fact that the men of the council, the victorious men of the council, split in the years that followed. And thereupon hangs a very interesting tale that's still worth pondering as we approach now the 50th anniversary of Vatican II.